Hi everyone, Chris Potts here. Uh, welcome to the fourth and final screencast in our series on noun compounds. The first three screencasts covered the paper called Systematicity in the Semantics of Noun Compounds, the Role of Artifacts versus Natural Kinds by Beth Levine, Lelia Glass, and Dan Jurafsky. Do watch those first. This screencast won't make much sense without those under your belt. So our focus for this screencast is solely on the in-class experiment that we did. Recall that Levine et al. did a comprehension experiment that I described as a free response comprehension experiment because participants were prompted with novel compounds like stew skillet and asked to just write out what they thought the compound was describing. And then in a subsequent coding phase, we got classifications for those statements and that allowed for a connection with the event-related modifier hypothesis and the essence-related modifier hypothesis. What we did was also a comprehension experiment, but it was meaningfully different. Ours can be described as a forced choice comprehension experiment. As participants, you were prompted with a novel compound like stew skillet, but I constrained you to choose between two options, one connecting with a perceptual reading and the other connecting with an event-related reading. In section 5.1 here, I've given all the materials from this little experiment. As you know, there were two surveys to support a cross design that closely resembles the one that Levine et al. used. Both surveys had item zero. It was a kind of warm-up item. I was just curious about what responses people would give to the compound bunny cake, and it also seemed smart to start with an item that wasn't too central to our core experimental manipulations. After that, there are items one, two, three, and four, and each of those is paired with A and B variants. And the idea here is to have a full representation across both surveys of all the different combinations that we can have of a modifier and a head as either an artifact or a natural kind. So for example, take item one, they share a modifier stew, which is an artifact. The skillet variant gives us an artifact artifact case, and the chickpea variant gives us an artifact natural kind case. Then item two does something similar, but built around spaghetti. Uh, the A example is artifact artifact, and the B example is artifact natural kind. So this lets us start to build two surveys. For survey A, we use items 1A and 2B. And for survey B, we use 1B and 2A. This gives us representation of both kinds of examples in a balanced way across the two surveys. And that pattern repeats for three and four, but now the examples are built around natural kind modifiers, swamp in three and stick in four. And then in the surveys, we do the same crossing of examples. Survey A gets 3A and 4B, and survey B gets 3B and 4A. So in the end, we get complete representation of the different modifier head combinations, and no one survey will lead people to make direct comparisons, say, between stew-based examples. As I said, this is broadly what Levine et al. did too, but they had more items. They had a bunch of distractor cases so that people were less likely to guess the goals of the study. And they shuffled the order of presentation for the items to try to avoid effects deriving from the order of presentation. So that's the overall design. Let's look at the response distributions and try to get a sense for whether these results are aligned with the core hypotheses from the paper or not, or maybe something in between. For the warm-up item, bunny cake, we have a natural kind artifact pattern. So we expect an event-related reading to dominate, but it's perhaps not surprising that we end up with something more perceptual. This seems to be common with cakes and other foods. Now we move to the core cases, which will come in pairs because of our design. So we start with artifact modifier, artifact head. This was a super clear case for Levine et al. And it's super clear for us to the event readings totally dominate for both spaghetti scissors and stew skillet. For natural kind modifier artifact head, the pattern is more mixed. The left example for swamp thermometer is nicely aligned with what Levine et al. predicted and what they saw. However, stick whisk is certainly more mixed and here perceptual readings dominate. I'm actually not sure what's happening here or how malleable this result is. Moving to artifact modifier, natural kind head, recall that this was the most uncertain category for Levine et al. It's arguably the one where we see a lot of reversals of the expected pattern given our overarching hypotheses. 
For what it's worth, spaghetti lettuce on the right behaves as we expected, with mostly perceptual readings. However, stew chickpea saw more eventive readings. And this might be because my gloss on the perceptual one isn't so plausible. It says a chickpea that tastes like stew. Um, perhaps keying into the color or consistency of stew would be more plausible. Finally, for the natural kind, natural kind cases, we again see something of a mix. Stick broccoli led to a lots of perceptual readings, as we'd expect on the essence-related modifier hypothesis, whereas swamp squash was more mixed, with event of reading slightly in the lead. So stepping back, overall, these results are somewhat mixed, but we still see a lot of consistency in interpretations, even if it doesn't always conform to our big overarching hypotheses. I strongly suspect that Levine et al. would not be surprised, and they might even be pleased by these results. After all, they were never claiming full predictability. What they wanted to, us to see is systematicity, a more permissive notion that still says a lot about our knowledge of language. And that's indeed what we see here, and that provides a nice transition into this very nice concluding note from the paper, which I'll just read. And they say, more broadly, we hope that this study exemplifies that the challenges posed by semantic context dependence can and should be tackled. Dowdy and Parti suggest that a fully compositional account of compound interpretation is not possible, as it requires context to precisely identify the relationship between a, no a compound's head and the modifier. Here we have developed an account of this form of context dependence by showing that the relationship posited between a compound's head and a modifier depends largely on whether the compound's referent is an artifact or a natural kind, and specifically on the feature salient to human interaction with that particular type of referent. More generally, we suggest that any time a semantic analysis depends heavily on context, it should be taken as a challenge to explain how, and this paper has tried to respond to one such challenge.